Not every repair is an epic one. Being able to identify simple problems will save you a lot of time in the long run, even if it's not quite so glamorous. Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. When I make a repair video, I usually focus on the ones that have some interesting twists or takeaways. But for every interesting repair, there are usually like 10 straightforward ones that are not worthy of a whole video by themselves. But to show that it's still important to check all the basics, today I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to tackle an Amstrad CPC 464. And in this particular case, spoiler alert, the fault is quite simple. You could actually just figure that out by looking at the video length anyway. But at the same time, it was maybe tricky enough to stumble a friend who does quite a few repairs. So let's see what a more straightforward repair looks like. Here's the boarding question. This is a Z7200, which is the second revision of the Amstrad CPC 464 board. This is actually my favorite board version because it's really roomy to work in there, and it's the most flexible with slots for both kinds of gate arrays and both kinds of keyboard connectors. So let's definitely try to save it. One neat thing about this board is that it comes with a switch on the power connector. I have one that I made myself that has a hard wire connection right there because it's so much more convenient to work with that instead of having to connect the upper part of the keyboard just to get the switch working. But this one is cool that it has an actual switch there, so that will be convenient. The owner told me it wasn't generating any video signal and that he had done some preliminary diagnostics and he was afraid it was a faulty gate array. Will that be it? Let's find out. But let's do this in the proper order. Let's turn it on and see if we get any video out. It's important to distinguish between getting a black screen and not getting any video signal at all. In this case, it looks like we're not getting any video whatsoever. When that happens, I like to look at the current consumption to get an idea of how much of the board is actually working. Here we're getting about 0.7 amps, which is what I would expect for an Amstrad CPC 464 with the new getter rate like this one. The old version of the getter rate consumes about 200 milliamps more or so. Okay, so far so good. If we're going to be methodical about this, the next thing I'll check are voltages. After seeing the current draw, I can tell that they're going to be fine, but you know, let's check just in case. I'm picking a place far away from the power connector and 4.6 volts. Now that's rather low, but in my experience, it's normal for this computer. There's no voltage regulator, so a certain amount of voltage drop is normal. And also there's something weird about my bench power supply that it makes it drop a bit more than normal for some reason. But anyway, this should be totally fine. Next, let's check clock signals. Again, I suspect that they're mostly going to be okay because without a clock signal at all, we would see a lot less current draw. But let's check. Maybe they're the wrong frequency or we get some, but not all of them. I'm checking the input clock signal into the gate array. This is generated by the quartz crystal and a couple gates and a few capacitors. I'm measuring it on the old gate array footprint because it's simpler, but the same signal goes to the actual chip. And yet we have a perfect 16 megahertz signal right there. The gate array then generates an output 4 megahertz clock signal that is sent to the Z80. So do we have a good signal there? And yeah, that looks perfect as well. So, so far, no surprises, but we also don't have any clues about what might be failing. Let's jump ahead and check the video signal directly. Specifically, let's look at the sync signal. And we have nothing there. So it wasn't just a malformed video signal that the TV wasn't able to display. There really was nothing. In that case, let's look at the sync signals that the gate array received from the CRT controller. Vertical sync. Oh, wow. V-sync is there, but it's super slow. Like really slow. It's one hertz. That would be one slow display. And horizontal sync. Nothing. So the CRT controller isn't generating the right sync signals. That's good to know. The CRT controller also gets an input clock that is used to generate some of those signals and really do everything else from that clock signal. So let's make sure that signal is correct. And yeah, that's a perfect one megahertz signal into the CRT controller. Let's check V-Sync and horizontal sync here directly. And yeah, they're the same as the get array. Okay. Here it may be tempting to think that the CRT controller is faulty. Although another reason for this might be a bad ROM, since that would make it so that the CRT controller wasn't initialized with the correct parameters. This was perfectly explained in this great meme after it came out in one of my earlier repair videos. And interestingly, since the CPU needs to be working correctly in order to read the ROM and set the correct initial parameters on the CRT controller, it becomes a full circular dependency. If any of those components aren't working correctly, the Amstrad will simply not work at all. 
Let's have a quick look at the CPU. If that checks out, then we'll try a different ROM. We'll start checking Z80 activity by looking at the memory request line. And it certainly seems to be busy enough, so that seems fine. The other lines I like to check are the read and write pins. We have plenty of read requests and no write requests, but that's fine if the initialization didn't go quite right and the Z80 is stuck in some kind of weird loop. And the other two really useful signals are M1 and refresh. M1, oh, there is nothing there. Let me check refresh. Yep, that one is working fine. But M1, nothing. And unlike other signals we saw before, M1 doesn't depend on anything externally. If there's no activity there, it means the Z80 just isn't working correctly. Fortunately, since the CPU comes socketed in the Amstrad, let's just swap it out for another one and check. I certainly got plenty of other Z80s to replace it with. And with the new Z80 in place, yeah, we definitely get M1 activity now, so I suspect that was it. Let's see if we get video. And there you go, the full basic prompt. So the Amstrad seems to be working, and the only problem was a somewhat faulty Z80. So that was pretty simple, but while we're here, let's dig just a little bit deeper. What exactly is the M1 line? Apart from showing that the Z80 is having some activity, what does it mean? How is it different from the refresh line, for example? And most importantly, why are they even exposed? M1 and refresh are control signals generated by the Z80 to coordinate things with the rest of the system. To understand them, let's look at a timing diagram of the operation of the Z80. Whenever the Z80 executes an instruction, it must first fetch the data containing the upcode of the instruction to be executed. This usually takes several clock cycles, and it's called the M1 cycle. Depending on the instruction, that one may be followed by other memory cycles after the M1. Knowing about the M1 is important so the rest of the system can work things around the Z80. During the M1 cycle, we can assert the wait signal if we need to make the Z80 wait for any reason. For example, there are times when the get array needs to access RAM at the same time as the Z80, so we'll set the wait signal at that time. Interestingly, not every system built around the Z80 needs to check M1. On the ZX Spectrum, for example, M1 is not even connected to anything other than the expansion port. In that case, the ULA just hard pauses the Z80 whenever it wants to by actually pausing the clock signal. So M1 is a signal that you should always see activity on if you have a healthy Z80. In this case, the CPU was probably not working properly, so it wasn't triggering M1. But in some cases, Z80 might work correctly and M1 is just missing. In that case, you'll run into either lockups or corruption as the CPU isn't able to coordinate memory access with other parts of the computer. The other signal that I always check for activity is refresh. The Z80 comes with a built-in DRAM refresh mechanism, so every time it needs to refresh a new memory address, it will turn on refresh and mem request signals. Again, you could ignore these signals if you build a computer around the static RAM, for example, but you should always see activity in there on a healthy Z80. When you look back at the repair, it sounds trivial. Just change the CPU and you're done. It was even already socketed. And while that's true, the important part was figuring out quickly what the faulty part was. This repair could have easily spiraled into a long repair had I not checked the basics. Seeing the weird CRTC sync signals made me think that there was something wrong with the CRTC or the get array or something in between. But fortunately, checking the other basic signals uncovered the easier problem right away. I hope you enjoyed this easier repair, and it's really more representative of a lot of everyday repairs, so this is the kind of thing you're more likely to find. Also, I wanted to give you a heads up on some of the changes coming up to the channel. My family and I are in the process of moving back to the US. And as a matter of fact, I am surrounded by boxes right now, and the movers are coming to pick them up in just a couple of days. During the move and after we get there, it's going to be kind of difficult to make new videos. I have a couple of videos that I'm in the middle of working, and so I'll be able to edit them and release them during that time, but don't be surprised if things slow down a little bit. Also, I'm leaving most of my lab equipment here to be able to continue working when we come in summers and other holidays, so once I get to the US, I'm going to have to set up the lab completely from scratch. I'm hoping to make a few videos showing the process, I think that's going to be interesting, and it's also I'm looking forward to having the chance to make the lab completely from scratch instead of slowly evolving it like I did with this one. 
So anyway, I need to finish packing all of this. Thanks for watching this episode and I will see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos and more. Thank you again to all the supporters, see you next time.